We hear it all the time. Creators feel like they're on a content roller coaster that never seems to get to the fun part. <laughs> Worse, at this rate, you know, you usually feel like you're going to burn out or completely run out of ideas without ever getting the growth that you know is right there. Usually one key problem is your content strategy. Let's talk about how to get the win by shaking that up today. Hey, welcome to the Video Creators Podcast presented by vidIQ. You know how you put a lot of time and energy into your YouTube channel for not nearly enough growth? Yep, we get it. We are here today to help you change that. Hello, creator. It's great to see you again for another Video Creators podcast episode, just like we do every Monday for you. We love to share more advanced growth tips and tactics, next level strategy, growing your business, helping you reach more people and change lives. And today I'm hanging out with Sam, one of the YouTube strategists here on our team. Hey, Sam, what's new in your part of the world? Nothing too much. Uh, as you know, we're getting packed up, ready to move here pretty soon. Not a huge uh, move. Nothing too much, but you're moving? <laughs> yeah, just a couple hours <laughs> south. So nothing too wild, but a move is a move nonetheless. So pretty soon here, probably not the next one we shoot, but pretty soon my backdrop will look a little different. But um, Ooh. I'll, I'll sound the same. So <laughs> <laughs> how about you? What's That's new? exciting. That's exciting. Let's see. For me, what's new? I just came back off of a few days off. I feel like every time we talk, I'm like just coming back off vacation. I know. Germany, <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> Recently, uh, I had the, I had the opportunity to spend some time with my uh, dad in Germany. And then but Mexico, that was a planned vacation that we never got to take last October because I came down with the vid. Not yep. video, but COVID. Our yes. good friend COVID. Yep. <laughs> Our good friend COVID. Yep. But I'm excited for today because we're talking about something that is near and dear to both yours and my heart, right? Right. Shaking things up. Shaking things up with content strategy. Every week, we love to talk to a creator who's actually experiencing growth on their channel. And today, Blake was talking to Amber Hollingsworth, who is a therapist who helps loved ones of addicts through the struggle of not really having great information uh, to lean on on the platform. And I really love how she reached out to us several months after uh, taking video labs to kind of showcase all the education that she put to use to experience new heights on her channel. Let's find out what happened. I've had my channel officially, like if you look back at the record, I think it started in 2016. And I started, probably didn't start to like consistently put content on there until probably like 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. And then um, it was slow. I tell you what, it took me like... I don't know, like a year to get a hundred people yeah. and then like another year. I mean, it was like so slow. So what, what did you like for, with your channel? What was kind of like your efforts? What did you want to get from YouTube? Well, uh, um, initially it's, it was sort of for my business, but also just mm -hmm. because there's such a lack of resources out there right? for people who have addicted loved ones. Um, I'm a therapist, so I see people who have addictions, but right. the People that are looking for help are actually the loved ones, not really the yeah. people that have addictions and they don't know what to do and they don't know how to get their loved one help. And they just, they're, you know, there's hardly any information and what there is, is kind of like bad information. So I really wanted to try to get right. out better information to help these family members, to be honest. And then the channel grew steadily, but slowly, slowly, right. steadily um, for a pretty good while. And then in, 2019 at the end of 2019 it hit a little streak and the, the funny thing there was I had posted some videos that weren't really my topic niche mostly just because I like my topic is addiction but I follow true crime and there was like this big true right. crime case and everyone was saying this guy had this diagnosis I was like no he doesn't and I was like I can't take it anymore and I just like said it and then of course those videos took off which was like really cool because just to watch I'm like oh my gosh that's what the algorithm does that's it like I've been hearing about it which was super cool, but in the long run, doesn't really help my channel because, you know, it, it's cool to have a videos, a few videos take off, but that's not really, you know, my primary people. So yeah, even though it spiked, I think over the course of a year or so, I sort of trickled and lost all those subscribers I gained from those videos right. that took off. And then I, and then for like 
two years, it was just like flat. Like I was growing. I was gaining like, you know, a thousand, 1200 subscribers a month, but the views were staying pretty steady. I mean, you could look at my graph for like two years and it's just like, well, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so I felt stuck. And that's why I decided to get into the video creators course, the video labs. For somebody starting out their channel or even in the same place as you, what's one piece of feedback you'd give them now knowing what you know now? Gosh, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing <laughs> <laughs> for somebody starting out. Um, probably if I was talking to someone starting out, I'd say you definitely have to niche down, which I know is like super common. And honestly, I don't think I'm niche down enough. Um, I could probably go further, mm -hmm. um, but because I already have this audience, which kind of comes from a couple of different buckets, it's hard to do that at this point, but that's a huge, that's a huge piece of it. Anything else? Um, I would say not to worry so much about like equipment and video quality. Cause I'm still not like the expert in all that. I have yeah, like yeah. You know, my Canon <laughs> and have it set up. So I don't have to touch it. Just turn it on each time, you know, so I'm figured out. Um, but some of my videos that do the best are not there. The quality, as far as like the, you know, the definite high definition is just not even not good. The video that took off for me, that was like in the true crime niche, I forgot to turn on my mic and it was like a live stream. It had all these views and all these subscribers and people couldn't even hear it. Like they were turning it all the way up on high, <laughs> highest they could go on their phone just to like hear my voice. And it's like, well, that really tells you that it's not like about this stuff. It's about something else. Yeah. So in terms of you, like what's, what's probably what your biggest win of since video labs? Well, I think for me, just watching the numbers go up each week now is, is like finally, cause I was just in such a <laughs> plateau for so long. Right. I was just like, I don't know if it's ever going to take off again. So it's not like skyrocketed, but that's okay because I had that before and that really wasn't that helpful, but it's just like gradually pacing up. Like I would, like I would want to, and that I know is like maintainable, you know, and to keep yeah. that momentum going. That's huge. I think, I, I think, I think about uh, people who ask me all the time, like, you know, what's a good pace for growing on YouTube? Should I like, I mean, you can explode and have a really big growth. I'm like, that's not always the most beneficial because you'll stress when that starts to fall down. But if you allow that slow snowball yeah. growth, you can have your hand on the wheel the entire time as you're growing. So your audience is growing with you and connect with you. So it gets to a point, if you just focus on your own lane and not everybody else's and trying to compete mm -hmm. with all these people and just focus on what, what works for your audience, it takes the pressure off you. People show up because of you. They watch your content because of you. Mm -hmm. It's valuable, but they also enjoy you. I mean, you have more control of your channel. People are showing up for the right reasons. You have the right audience. It's so much more beneficial to snowball your channel than it is to just blow up and then freak out. And how do I... How, how did this happen? Like, and that's the question people have a lot. I don't know what I did that caused it to, to blow up. Right. So right. it can cause stress right. for people for sure. But anyways, really great to have you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story. It's really encouraging. I'm glad to see that you're having some really great results in your channel. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I love Amber's key takeaways here on getting help on figuring out how to actually implement storytelling and community strategy into her overall content strategy. That's really um, what you need to help cr connect with your viewers so that they're actually getting through your content and it's making a bigger impact on your audience. And now she's seeing consistent, steady growth. To work closely with one of our strategists, just like Amber did, uh, we would love to talk to you. We want to hear your story. We want to know about what's going on on your YouTube channel. What are your goals? What are your roadblocks? Where do you need help in your own content strategy? If it makes sense for us to work together, we'll explore what that would look like. And if not, no problem. We just want the opportunity to be able to connect with creators like yourself. Uh, to work with Sam, Blake, myself, or anybody else on the team, we would love to help you reach those new levels. Go to videocreators.com forward slash discovery call and book a free 15 minute session with us. Everybody's YouTube channel starts with a passion, but eventually most creators, they get to a point where content doesn't really hit or worse, stuff does hit and you just double down in that direction. And that kind of leaves a lot of creators feeling paralyzed because they don't know what to do next. One of the pieces of winning at YouTube is solid content strategy, but it's more than just one thing. 
there's actually several things to be mindful of. Sam, I know that you have had so many conversations with creators specifically around content strategy, whether it was in a consultation and video labs, working one-on-one long-term with clients, what's probably one of the biggest things that stands out to you that's missing or maybe should be tweaked, I guess is a better way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think one of the first things that comes to mind is, is probably ideation, just kind of in general. It was actually really interesting what you were saying a second ago, which is so true of it's, it's when something does hit and you double down on it and then you double down on it and then you double down on it. And then that becomes your life and you get stuck in that hamster wheel so quickly of like, I can't do anything else. <laughs> like I can't do exactly. any other types of ideas. I think there's a fear or maybe a misconception out there that, you know, you can, you can break your channel. Um, if you were to try something else, it, it's kind of that like correlation versus causation question Mm -hmm. of of like you know i have to keep doing this because this is what my audience wants where in reality you kind of have the keys to the kingdom here like you can yeah maybe this took off and and there's a time and place where it's great to double down on that but i think as we're kind of ideating our content more from a bird's eye view and not so zoomed in um you know you can be at a really healthy place that doesn't lead to that exhaustion or that hamster wheel right yeah and I feel like when we talk to creators about this very thing, because I've had so many consultations around this one specific thing, I feel like, and I don't know if you've had the same experience, but a lot of creators feel like at this point they need to pivot their channel, right? Because they went in one direction and they forgot about the big picture. Because like you said, they stayed zoomed in. And so Mm -hmm. now they don't feel like they can actually talk about the thing that they created their channel about in the first place. So what would be some practical steps that you could uh, give our audience on if they are in this situation um, on how to actually dig out of that hole? Yeah. Well, I think the, the audience is actually the first thing I would say, who is your audience? I would really dig into who exactly are we talking to here? Um, Part of, part of that. I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. Part of it is, I think as a creator, it can feel like we're throwing ideas into the void and it's just kind of like, you know, the YouTube algorithm might just bless me one day and it'll reach the right people and whatever happened to work, kind of like what we were saying a second ago, like we'll just keep doing that over and over and over. But if we actually treat our audience like they're real people out there and it's like a real one-on-one experience or interaction because every single view is a one-on-one engagement. If we can think of it that way is like, there's a real person on the other side of the screen. How do I think of my channel? And I know we talk about value proposition all the time, but if we can think about our channel and that person out there who we're trying to reach and just on like a human level, what is going to help this person, you know, with where they're at, how is my channel going to help them? And even just taking that second to step back and see it from that other perspective, most of the time it's kind of like, oh, well, maybe I wouldn't have ever considered doing this type of video or this type of video. And all of these things kind of fall under the umbrella of what my channel is and how I can reach this person. And that can actually be really freeing sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like a really good practical first step, and this applies whether you're stuck and pit, feel pigeonholed or like you you have analysis paralysis or anything like that, or just really you're just stuck with just ideation in general, a good practical exercise would be to almost just title vomit, right? Idea, a video idea vomit, like do a complete brain dump Um on into a book. Like I personally keep a little red book. I usually have it right here, but it's somewhere. Um, And I have pages and pages and pages of video ideas. Because if you come up with like a 100 ideas, you could probably granted, would they all make? could, Could they all be content on your channel? Yeah, sure. Are they going to be the pieces of content that are going to go the farthest? Probably not. So by having all these ideas, let's say you have 100 ideas or 50 ideas, and can you whittle that list down to the three best ideas or the one? 
and then make that and really spend time on that versus just coming up with ideas and throwing some spaghetti at the wall, which tends to happen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, For it's so creators. True. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the quality over quantity conversation mm. where yes, it there is. can be good things about quantity, about getting more content out, depending on, you know, where you're at with the channel and context obviously matters. But, um, I would say too, you know, you're kind of wasting your time if you're just throwing content over and over and over and like hoping something, something works. I, I just actually finished, um, working with somebody on Friday who we were working on a bit of a longer term basis. And I think I showed you their report, Ingrid, but Mm -hmm. they, um, they backed off the amount of content they were making over by like over three times. They were making about three times less content than what they were doing before. And not only did the average video go further after focusing on the quality of it, but they, even if you were to just kind of double the the numbers and metrics that came in, um, you know, she still would have outperformed on her newer content. So she saved herself so much exhaustion and the headache yeah. by backing out, backing down and was able to do exactly what you're talking about, like taking all these ideas, whittle them down, really give it the time it deserves. And it's almost more fueling, I think, as a creative as well. Um, it's yeah. more enjoyable to put pieces of content out that you're proud of. Well, and I think that there's something really key about what you just said. So much of it is, you know, when you think about it, you're producing less content you're taking a little bit more time to really create quality content. But by creating less, you're also going to kind of prevent that hamster wheel and that burnout feeling that a lot of creators end up feeling. Because here's the thing, just creating more content, all you're doing is just duplicating all the things that you've been doing. It's not necessarily going to get you results. Right. Um, It might get you some results, But if you had taken time to really develop an idea, the idea, right, how much farther could that go? If you really took the time in ideating the right titles, the right thumbnails for that idea, um, thinking about the structure. uh, And I know somebody out there is probably going, listening, going, yeah, okay, you two, but what is the right idea? Well, (laughs) We have some practical steps for you too there. <laughs> what are yeah. some things that you can you can think of, Sam, that you do with clients, you know, when it comes to content, developing like a solid content strategy? Yeah, well, I think there are some different, I guess, content. So I, I, we talk about the three bucket strategy a lot, you know, on the, on the yeah. podcast, having kind of the discoverable pieces that go further, community content for your audience, sales content to, to make a good sale. But I almost like to think of kind of a separate, separate from the three buckets of our content strategy, like more like topic buckets too. Maybe like we can put these buckets over here as we're thinking about what our channel is, um, what like what is the value proposition? What are we even? What is the value that we're giving our viewer, like our real human viewer, like we talked about? Um, if we can think under that umbrella of like what are just some different topic buckets that we could do. You know, maybe we try to make some that are more trending and maybe tapping into some current events, current things that are going on where maybe they don't really have the longest shelf life and it's not necessarily going to go, you know, be this steady eddy that goes on forever, but it could potentially bring a lot of new viewers to our channel for the first time. That could be a topic bucket, but maybe we could also try to make more of an evergreen type of video where, you know, this ideally is going to kind of tap into letting YouTube do the work for us where it can just live on and go on and on and on. So that's something I usually like to talk about just with some of the creators that I work with as far as, okay, there are different content buckets with this three bucket strategy, but we can also think of different topic buckets for kind of like what kind of variation, what kind of ideas can we come up with here to accomplish some of these different things? Yeah. And I really love the way that 
uh, you kind of put that because when you're looking at the trending topics, and that's a great bucket, and and it, it's confusing, I know, because we talk about three bucket strategy, and then we talk There's about too topic many buckets. buckets. Yeah. <laughs> too many bucket, too many buckets. We need a different word for the topic buckets. Yeah, topic, <laughs> topic pales. vertical, whatever you want to. <laughs> what pales? There you go. <laughs> um, you know. When you have those trending pieces, you're going to have a higher spike. If you're looking at your analytics, those are going to be some of those spikes. You know, you have those newer your, those newer videos, and the trending ones probably go way farther um, than some of your more evergreen content when that's first released. But the thing about the evergreen content is you're going to con- – like Sam said, constantly be bringing in more and more traffic because those will grow and go farther over time. Time. And the thing that those are so great at is helping to raise that baseline of views for you. But having the blend of the two is a great strategy. So if you're not doing that, I would highly consider that. Um, another thing that, you know, that I like to do with a lot of creators is also take a look at and, and uh, granted, you know, this is really more applicable for the established creator who's been who has a little bit of a library of content. Um, what are the pieces or the topics that have gone farther for you? You know, can you, and if they're older, a lot, I was just working on this with a client that I've been working with long term just the other day, you know, and I had suggested, okay, well, let's take a look at some of the pieces that really went far. Now, you made these three, four years ago. Your videos are nowhere near where they were back then. Right. right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I had the same conversation with somebody yesterday. Yeah. Right. We this is one of those things that we talk about all the time. Can you remake these with your new editing style, your new primal branding voice, you know, all the ways that you're working storytelling and that you didn't know to do before? Can you make these that much better? Or if they're really bringing in steady steady content, can you make a part 2? that didn't exist before. Um, And then what, maybe like take one of those topics. And I think like Ryan Trahan is a great example. We're probably going to use him because he, he did a couple things in the last year that are really smart strategy, content strategy wise. One was to take a topic that he was experimenting with. Experimenting is always something you want to do, but he turned it into, because it was performing and he had kind of cultivated the experiment a little bit over, I, I want to say like more than a year, right? Is that, I know you're a fan also, but I feel like he experimented with yeah. the Penny series for over a year. Yeah, he did. It before, finally got yeah. to a place, yeah, where he was able to turn it into a bigger series. And that's another, another great strategic thing that you can do with content. So, you know, how can you take a solid idea and turn it Mm -hmm. into more? And I feel like, you know, creators, you know, I feel like we always talk about some of the biggest, biggest ones, but you know, they have, they've all done this strategically, like Jimmy Donaldson, Mr. Beast, same thing. You know, he experimented many, many times with, you know, if I put all this in a circle, you know, and he cultivated that idea until it then became a series. So, um, what else would you say? Yeah. That so you actually, would do? I have a, a question for you. So I'm just okay. imagining maybe a listener right now is hearing this and they're maybe thinking, okay, that makes sense. But didn't you, you guys just said a couple minutes ago that we're not trying to get kind of pigeonholed into this, making the same video over and mm. over and getting in that hamster wheel. So I guess I'm curious, how would you, how would you differentiate what you're saying now mm-hmm that? I think that's a great question. I think the differentiation between it is when I'm talking about a series, a series has an end in sight. So it's not that you're just going to pigeonhole yourself over this one thing. You know, when you go back to Ryan Trahan, the, um, the Penny series, it had a third, what was it? A 30 day cap? I think think so. Yeah. 30 days. He was very clear that when he brought that penny across the country from LA all the way to Jimmy in North Carolina, um, that was the end. So there was an end in sight. Now it's about making other things. So, and when you are also working on a series, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a series that takes place, you know, five videos in a row. It can also have other content interspersed in between. So, yeah. I totally agree. And if there's anything I would add to that, it's just 
experimentation is good. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is just a balanced thing. So if there's something that's working and it's bringing in viewers, like it's great to continue with that. See how can we kind of keep moving with some of that momentum. If there's an older video that did really great, can we make a version 2.0 of that? I mean, all of this I think is really great and healthy, but I wouldn't, only do that forever <laughs> you know for the rest of your life's life on on youtube only doing those things i think taking that into account and then experimenting too so you're still moving forward in a way is is really helpful yeah and i think too another thing to just remember when it comes to experimenting first off experimenting is a great way for you to have a little fun too try something new the key to remember is it's okay that it doesn't have the results yeah. that you're looking for. Yeah. It's really more about asking yourself, stepping back, which is so hard to do, but it, it, when you're experimenting, know that it's an experiment. Step back and ask yourself, what was the lesson that I learned here? Because the more minor tweaks you make to your content in your overall strategy, you will end up getting to the place that you're trying to get to. Totally agree. Yeah, it's that question of like, where am I finding the value in this upload? Because I think you need to look a lot deeper than just views when it comes to videos. You can look at so many different places and it's, what am I trying to accomplish with this experiment? And not just only views, <laughs> you know, is it I'm trying to connect with my yeah. audience more? Let's look at the quality of the comments I'm getting. If it's just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach a broad, broader audience because I'm serving the same food to the same people over and over and over. Um, yeah, where are we looking there? Are we looking at impressions? Are we looking at non-subscribed views compared to subscribed views? There's a lot of places in our analytics to kind of evaluate that too. So even if the video appears to maybe be a flop and it didn't get as many views, you might be pushing the right needle in the right direction depending on what you're trying to do. Do you have any thoughts on content strategy? Because I know you do this a lot with your clients as well. Um, analyzing your competition is there anything that can be, you know, learned or seen that you can take and tweak for yourself? Totally, yeah. How would they do that? Yeah, yeah. so I think practically what you can do, and I, I do this a lot. Um, if there's a similar type of video to the one that you're about to make, you can just do a YouTube search and search up similar type of video. And I will really look for videos that have the, the channel has a bit of a lower subscriber count and a much higher view count so that you kind of have some evidence mm -hmm. to see like oh this particular video that this creator did went really far and it's similar to mine that i'm about to make so you can look for those types of videos and just take mental notes of what does the thumbnail look like what is happening in the thumbnail how is the title structured maybe watch the video. What are they doing within the video itself? You know, wh how, what did I notice from the opening 15 seconds, the last 15 seconds? Um, mm -hmm. You can really evaluate a lot from other videos out there as far as kind of practically just getting some new ideas. And that might give you some food for thought as far as, oh yeah, you know, I didn't even think to frame it that way. And I wouldn't, I, I always give the caveat of, I wouldn't just go completely copy another video yeah. out there like word for word same exact sort of thing but it's the same kind of thing it's like you know the the best musicians listen to the most music like uh, it's great to always be watching even if it's not even necessarily within your niche or like a competitor so to say um i did air quotes totally. for those listening <laughs> a competitor <laughs> um you know i think it's really helpful just to get inspiration and always be <clears throat> learning and just seeing how could I frame this a different way or a new way, you know, that can be helpful. Yeah. And I love what you just said there, because I feel like there's so many amazing ideas in niches that have nothing to do with my channel, right? Probably nothing that has to do with your channel, nothing that has to do with the video creators channel. Right. But there's some sort of magic or something that might spark that idea for you. And then how can you take that and twist it for whatever it is that you do for your target audience on your channel? How can you serve them with a completely unique idea? 
it's all about putting your blinders on and just being different. And then again, experimenting and having fun. Yep. Totally agree. Yep. Totally agree. I think there's a lot of crossover too. Like with what you said about different niches, there was a woodworking yeah. channel I worked with um, a little while ago and we together looked at a lot of cooking channels. Cause I think there's a lot of crossover sometimes in the way that they're presenting solutions for their target audience as far as like making food quicker or like on a budget where there's maybe a lot of similarities in the audience for the woodworkers who don't have a lot of spare time after their day job and are trying to do it cheaper. So you can kind of glean a lot of really helpful things from some of those kind of crossover niches too. Yeah, that's a great point. So curious because I know your love of analytics <laughs> and we like, and we like that he's a yep. total, total geek when it comes to oh, analytics. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was reining myself back earlier when I started talking yes, about <laughs> some of those analytics. I love it. <laughs> what are some practical things that you can give someone that's listening because we, I mean, we like to make data driven decisions, but at some point I feel like sometimes with content strategy, we need to also step back a little. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, it feels like balance keeps coming up in this conversation. <laughs> there does. needs to be a good balance with analytics too. Like yeah, it can be great and healthy to be looking in there and I like I'm all for empowering any creator that I work with with all the tools that we have. It may be kind of confusing to look in the YouTube studio, but there's a lot of really great tools there that can really help you draw some really important conclusions that maybe you may have missed on, on past videos. But I think it can be harmful if we're just constantly in there 24 seven, every single video, like, oh, my click through rate, like, why is this not? better why is this not good this isn't what i what i want it to be and so i really do think having well i think the intent behind whatever the newest upload you have like knowing exactly what the intent was for that type of video whether it was more community engagement or reaching the broader audience or something like that is helpful to give you kind of some tracks to run on once you go look in your analytics and you're not just like, I'm going to go open the YouTube studio today and just kind of get lost because that can be really overwhelming. So, you know, mm -hmm. let's say for example, we're working on growing a channel and it's just, I'm trying to break out and reach a, a new audience. They don't know who I am yet. So we're going to tap into one of these practical tools we just talked about. We're going to make a video on a trending topic, something that's really trending right ha right now. It kind of fits with my value proposition and my channel. So we make the video and then it starts to do pretty well and we start to bring in some views. I would say if we're going to go look in our analytics, maybe we can, I mean, we can look at a handful of different things, but maybe we can really pay attention to the impressions. Maybe not even necessarily the click-through rate and just let's just look at the impressions as a first step and see is this being shown to way more people out there that's kind of a good starting point for us and that can even just in itself be a kind of a nice quick little check-in to see like okay did this kind of push the needle forward on what i was trying to do here yes or no and then after that it's okay to just kind of step back and put your energy and your focus on the next video how can we keep doing that or how can we you know focus on the intent of our of our next upload so yeah i think there's kind of a lot there but that's maybe some of the first thoughts that i have but i'm i'm curious what you think i feel like another very much along those lines too is like with the retention graph i love the retention graph it's one of my favorite tools i get giddy knowing that, yeah, I did say that word, but giddy knowing <laughs> <laughs> that um, I have the ability to see that. Now, if only YouTube could break it down. And if I know you're listening, YouTube, somewhere, somebody's listening. <laughs> I want the retention graph to show me how a non-subscriber and a subscriber reacts to that. That's please. my <laughs> wish list. That's my, Sam's saying, please. Yes, that's please. my wish list. Because I am so curious if they're different. <laughs> so curious. <laughs> but I feel like even with the rich information that we get from YouTube, 
um, with the graph, you sometimes have to look beyond it. And I know that that just sounds like the complete opposite of anything anybody has ever heard me say before. But it's really about looking at the big picture. Sometimes when you have a loss, is it okay to have a little bit of a loss? So if I'm dipping into like a primal branding moment or something where I'm looking to connect with my audience on a creed or a belief or a little bit about my creation story, and yeah, I might have an initial loss on that, but does it result in a flat area on my graph to where I now am connecting in a much deeper level than I was where people were, you know, maybe I wasn't holding their attention. So you have to kind of step back sometimes and what are the key takeaways from the data that's being shown you? I see you do this all the time when we 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 richly analyze graphs when we work with clients one on one and we have access to their back end data. So what are some of the insights that you've seen um, from graphs and how have you maybe you know advised clients around around some of those takeaways that they don't see? Oh yeah. It's funny. I feel like 99% of the, the the most enjoyment that I get from looking at retention graphs is when we are working on primal branding together. And yeah. I always get a little bit of, they maybe they're vocal about it, maybe they're not, but the creator is a little bit like, should I really put that in in this video? Yeah. Like, are you, is that really yeah. going to help me and help my retention? And it's so interesting to always see, like, maybe as you're filming... Always you're kind of like, everyone's going to skip past this little Mm -hmm. anecdote that I just shared about the tacos that I ate last week or whatever, you know, however, it's going to tie into my, to my video. And of course you're laughing because of course I bring up tacos because, because you work, you work tacos and yeah, I can't stop talking about tacos, (laughs) but um, yeah, you know, those are the moments that I always point out to the creators that I work with, like, look how flat this section is where you, I I may have mentioned this before, but one of the guys that I'm working with right now who talks a lot about men's clothing shared his really strong beliefs about suspenders. And he, you know, maybe took about 30 seconds or so to really just say, you know, like, I'm going on a rant here, but, you know, suspenders are just, they're the, the best piece of male clothing for this reason and this is why they're so underrated (laughs) and it was kind of funny but that was super flat you know the audience really Mm -hmm. enjoyed that little peek into his kind of beliefs and his thoughts and that primal branding there so yeah i I I always like to look for those moments because it's always nice to turn around and show the creator like look how engaged everybody was when you were utilizing the primal branding tools that we were just talking about um, is, is really cool. And you you said one key word when he was talking about that. You said the word rant, which is an emotional word. Yeah. It makes me feel like, oh, there's something coming. I need to listen. But what he really leaned into was a belief. You know, and this is where, you know, sometimes creators, like like you said, they we get such pushback, you know, and 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 almost like are a little untrusting that it's going to work, but the data never lies. And the data always proves that it's the right decision. So granted, you may have, you know, you may feel like it's going a little slower and maybe coming into that, you may have a little teeny tiny bit of dip, but that's okay because you're going to be completely flat. Sometimes you need to step back and look at the bigger picture um, of what, what is really truly going on? And then what are those takeaways? And then how can you tweak the next video? It's okay if you fail. It's 100% okay if you fail. Actually, I challenge you to fail 100 times. You're never going to be able to do it. But along the way, you will learn so many important things about your content, your audience, and what really types of content really impact them. You know, and get to the point where you're having fun because I guarantee you that the results will be there. Oh, a hundred percent agree. I think one of the most excited things that I, Oh my gosh, I can't speak English. I think the most excited moments that I have doing this job (laughs) are when a creator can say like, yeah, the numbers are up and this looks great, but I am so excited to go create 
like to go make more videos, yeah. I feel so excited. Like that's the thing that gets me going. And so I really do think, I mean, all of this stuff that we're talking about here, hopefully sounds really freeing because I think it really can be, and it really can inject some life into your kind of creative juices too. Yeah, totally agree. I think you know, it's just really important to remember to just spend time on what's important. Um, and for Sam, that's tacos and coffee. Yes. You can work yeah. that into the conversation. Speaking of key takeaways, <laughs> <laughs> the real takeaway here is tacos. The real takeaway is tacos. <laughs> yes. That's what we're trying to talk about here. Taco yeah. about. Ultimately, it's about respecting the audience. You know, it's not about you. Okay. It is a little bit, but ultimately it's about me, the viewer. I hate to break it to you. That's true. If you and, and just one key point to really remember, and this is really about stepping back and looking at your content from a little bit, you know, maybe a different perspective. If you wouldn't sit through your branded spot or you wouldn't sit through whatever it is that you're doing, those extra call to actions, why would your audience? You know, it's important to make your audience a part of your conversation and to really remember that it's all about you having fun that's ultimately going to connect with them. We love to leave you here with a power tip here at the end. And I've got a great one today. <laughs> I can't, Sam, you're gonna, you're gonna love this because this is really one of my biggest pet peeves is the ranking of oh, X yeah. out of 10. <laughs> it Same. causes such creators such anxiety. But yeah. YouTube has running an, is they're running an experiment, which is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> they're revisiting additional ways of potentially sharing that information mm. with you. Now, you can actually do this only on Studio Mobile at this point because it is an experiment, but you can actually click a little down arrow right next to that and the card will actually um, come collapse, which is really cool. Or you can leave it expanded. Um, the nice part about it being collapsed is it's not really in your face. So you don't have to have anxiety going into studio knowing that it's just going to be right there. Now, if you want to go seek out the information, all you got to do is go to the video level and it'll share that information with you, which is really cool. Um, studio will also remember whether you want it collapsed or stayed open for the next time. Uh, so they're kind of keeping your creator mental health in mind. Thanks for listening to another video creators podcast episode. See you next week. Bye.